at a message entitled uh, Desperate uh, Faith as uh, Matthew continues to lay out the ministry of uh, Jesus to us uh, there in the Galilee area. And uh, once again, there's a couple of dynamics going. The crowds are getting larger because of the uh, tremendous numbers of, of healings and miracles that are taking place in the thousands and before it's over with probably the tens of thousands. And we'll see that reiterated at the end of the text that everyone that came uh, that was healed. Uh, the other thing that's going on is uh, we mentioned last week at this point there's an official delegation from Jerusalem that is now on the scene to check out what uh, Jesus is doing. Many uh, uh, running around in that time period and, uh, and after the time of Jesus uh, making messianic claims and they are there as an official delegation to check out what he's doing, the claims he's making. He's beginning to use uh, the term son of man for himself from Daniel 9, uh, his claim to messiahship, and we'll see uh, others uh, in the crowd claim, calling out to him as the son of David, again, a messianic uh, name for Jesus. So there's the crowds are growing in terms of uh, his popularity and, and recognition. He's trying to quiet that down because his time has not yet come. He's trying to put off a direct conflict with the uh, basically the Sanhedrin and uh, Jerusalem for a time, although that would uh, happen in the future. And at the same time, again, proving his credentials as well as seeing his compassion as he reaches out and does uh, miracles and healings. The point here is uh, we're going to look at some people that come to him that are, that are very desperate. And, um, and uh, desperation will will make people courageous and even courageous in their faith at times. I don't know if you saw the story uh, just on Friday from uh, Chino Hills in Southern California, but there was uh, a young gal that was a nanny watching a 14-year-old who turned away for a moment, heard a scream from another mom and looked back and a wolf had her toddler in its mouth ready to run off with it. She, without hesitation, according to the eyewitnesses, sprang into motion. Fortunately, she was very close by, no hesitation, grabbed the baby, and a tug of war ensued, and she was able to free the baby and get it out of the mouth of the wolves. Other moms probably typically don't do this, but they also ran towards the wolf, yelling and screaming and waving their arms to, uh, to change, uh, chase the wolf off. Uh, again, uh, that's not something that this young gal probably normally does when she sees a wolf. But under that circumstance, uh, the desperation of it all caused her to be much more courageous. And uh, we're going to see that kind of courage in terms of faith within a few of the people we're going to look at this morning. Again, we're in Matthew 9 and starting in verse uh, 18. We're going to look at a father who is delayed in his attempt to save his daughter We'll learn more about him in a moment. Verse 18, while he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, my daughter, he said, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. When Jesus entered the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. News of this spread uh, through all that region. So again, a couple of things about this father who's going to get uh, delayed in his attempt to save his daughter. And the first one, uh, this is a father who would come in an attitude of humility and to understand the humility, you need to understand a little bit about him. Now, in the other Gospels, uh, this story is covered in Mark's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel, and we know that his name is uh, Jairus or Jairus, and he is the not just the, a ruler, he is the synagogue ruler. He's not just the synagogue ruler. We know from the Greek text, he's 
is the chief synagogue ruler there in Capernaum, the synagogue that Jesus would have taught in, uh, in many times, that uh, everybody in that community would have tremendous respect for him. Again, he's not the chief rabbi, he's the ruler. So he oversaw the, the business affairs, made arrangements for uh, a tenorette rabbis to teach like Jesus and, uh, and so forth. But he held a very prestigious place in that community. And I, I don't know how to, in our culture, you know, have a, an equal or whatever, but he would have been well known and very well respected. Uh, but we see him come to Jesus uh, in um, tremendous humility. Now, try to keep in mind a little of the political dynamics that you have an official group from Jerusalem on the scene. He's the official synagogue ruler, and they're there checking out Jesus. Is he the Messiah? Which it will turn out they don't really care if he is or not. They want to basically do what they can to end his popularity and potential power that uh, he may have over the people. What this guy is doing, coming to Jesus, is not politically correct, nor would it have been expedient for his career, and so on and so forth. Uh, he's, he's the representative of, and at least at this point, those that seem to be in oppos opposition to Jesus. So he's, he's risking a lot to do this, but on the other hand, hey, he's a father. Uh, we find out this is his only daughter. She's 12 years old. Uh, at 12, 12 would make her uh, a woman in that culture. Uh, he would already had thoughts, him and his wife, of her future husband, her future wedding, all the plans that would be coming up in the next three or four years. And she's laying sick and she's dying. Now, we know that from the other Gospels that when he gets there, she's just sick and dying. We know that a point in time in this conversation, because of the delay with the woman, she ends up dying. Uh, but he's a guy that comes in tremendous uh, humility. Uh, Again, let me read from the King James Version, or New King James, verse 18, and this will help us understand the humility. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, my daughter has just died. So that term, again, uh, worshipped or bowed down means to kiss towards, literally. Uh, it's the idea, again, he is not worshiping Jesus as deity or anything at that point, but uh, this would be basically a position of humility you would take before a king or a ruler, bowing down, but bowing down in subjection and so forth. So uh, there's tremendous humility in what he's doing. Now, at the same time, it's very interesting that that Greek term has a counterpart in the Hebrew when we find it in, in Psalm 2, uh, a messianic psalm uh, about the Messiah. And there in Psalm 2, verse 12, it says that word, kiss the son or worship or kiss towards. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And what I want to suggest is that's exactly what this guy is doing. He is kissing towards, he is bowing down in that sense, uh, worship in terms of Jesus because he is seeking to be blessed and taking refuge in, in him. Uh, so there's a tremendous humility uh, in, in this man and there's a sense of worship as well, at least in the wording. And I want to suggest that if you're a dad and you're trying to intercede for your kids, is a very good example. Come to the Lord in tremendous humility and worship and we'll see that uh, what he's asking for is, is mercy. Uh, secondly, this father would acknowledge the power of Jesus. Again, there's a, certainly a sense of urgency of what's going on, as would be your case if you believed your daughter was dying, in the process of dying, and she was. Again, Mark's gospel, parallel account, Mark 5.22 says, Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there, seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with them, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So again, when he first approaches, uh, she has not died yet, but she will uh, while this conversation is going on with the woman. He comes, he asks, Jesus says, yes, we'll go with you. And then somebody touches his garment, <laughs> the woman with the issue of blood. And we're going to talk about her in a moment. But the whole point is that, that this guy is showing, in a sense, tremendous faith, tremendous courage. Now he's seen Jesus heal He's probably seen him heal many, many times. He's heard him teach and so forth. And obviously, he's expressing tremendous faith in the fact that Jesus can uh, heal his daughter. 
Uh, so it, it doesn't matter how politically correct it is. It doesn't matter how public it is. It doesn't matter how far down on his face he has to get for the sake of his daughter, like that nanny. He's going to do what he has to do because he's desperate, but he's also courageous uh, in his faith at, at this point. And, uh, <laughs> and this is uh, very interesting. Obviously, Jesus could have said, you know, it's all right. Your daughter's healed. Just go home. But he doesn't. In fact, he could, he could have said, your daughter's going to be okay, uh, but I need to take a moment and deal with this woman. He doesn't. He just kind of leaves the guy hanging. Okay, we'll go. You kind of hang on right there. You know, in those times when you're really desperate and you're crying out to the Lord and you're asking him right now, maybe healing, maybe a job situation, maybe whatever it is, you're kind of desperate, you're coming to the Lord and the Lord has a tendency, that's good. Can you just kind of hang on right there just a moment? And, and then what happens is he kind of turns the heat up on this guy through, through the delay now of dealing with the woman. Uh, it turns out uh, a message ar arrives, and that's in Luke 8, 49. While Jesus was still speaking, someone from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, comes and says, your daughter is dead. He said, don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she'll be healed. It's very difficult to do both, to be afraid and have faith. <laughs> I find those two things mutually exclusive. Uh, it's either one or the other. We either live in fear or we, or we live in faith. And, and again, Jesus is <clears throat> doing this, I believe, to, in a sense, allow this guy to, to be stretched, to grow in his faith, to learn to uh, trust Jesus in, in a greater capacity. At this point in time, now, we know we're from the other, we've, we've read the book right? Uh, we know the rest of the story. He doesn't. Uh, we know that later Jesus would uh, heal and, and rise others up from the dead. We, of course, Lazarus and, uh, and others and so forth. None of that has happened at this point. Jesus is saying, can you believe something you've never seen me do before? Can you believe Jesus to do something in your life you've never seen him do before? that temper that you wished you didn't have and you've been dealing with? Do you really believe the Lord can deal with those things? And do you believe that sometimes he'll place you in a difficult situation and then make it more difficult <laughs> in order that you would really come to him and trust to him in a greater capacity? And in the moment when you don't think you can take it anymore, then you read in the scriptures, you read in the word that he would have you be faithful and not fearful. Anyway, that's what's going on in, uh, in this man's life. Don't be afraid, just believe. And again, he, he cares about the woman, he's going to deal with her, but he cares about Jairus as well. I was just reading uh, through the Psalms this week and came across uh, a couple of uh, beautiful passages. Psalm 112 verse 4 says, uh, Even in, in darkness light dawns for the upright, for the gracious and compassionate and righteous man. I underline that kind of stuff. Those are the ones I write in my journal. And then I pray, knowing that my righteousness is only in Christ. I pray that I would be upright, gracious, and compassionate. And mostly I pray then that even in the darkness, I'd be able to see the light that's dawning somewhere. Because I know that somewhere God is faithful if to, for that dawn to come, if I'll be looking for it. And then later in verse 7, the psalmist writes, He will have no fear of bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is secure. He will have no fear. No fear of bad news. Do you ever fear bad news? Do you ever, do you ever fear that, that phone call or this or that? Or you're really concerned? It could be a great Father's Day message about your kids or what they're doing or what's going on with them and what might happen and all the what ifs. Yet the Bible says to us, don't have fear of sudden disaster. You know, that we can trust the Lord. His heart is secure. He will have no fear. A little bit of what maybe Jarius is going through himself. Proverbs 3.25 says, Have no fear of sudden disaster or the ruin that overtakes the wicked, for the Lord will be your confidence and keep your foot from being snared. But there's a tendency to have fear of sudden disaster. Is it? Oh, the economy. Do you know what's going on with the economy? Oh, I'm really concerned. You know, <laughs> you can get caught up into other circumstances and, and forget who's sovereign over the circumstances. And uh, the Lord would have us keep our eyes on him. 
But again, the, the faith of the father is incredible. He's gotten that news from saying, don't bother the teacher anymore. Uh, again, verse 18, uh, he says, my daughter has just died, but come put your hand on her and she will live. I know it hasn't ever been done before, but I believe you can do it. That's, that's pretty, pretty heavy, heavy faith there uh, of, of this guy. And, um, and God's going to honor that faithfulness. Now, the third thing we see with him is this father would face a difficult atmosphere in, in his home. <laughs> I don't know if you ever face difficult atmospheres in your home, but uh, this one is quite the scene. By the time they get there, of course, uh, uh, as we know that his daughter has died, and the, uh, the professional mourners have arrived, the flute players and so forth. And again, that seems uh, uh, strange to us. Yes, professional mourners. And, and the more you cared about that loved one, the, the more mourners that you would hire and make more of a commotion and, uh, and so forth. And all of that scene is, is going on out uh, in front of the house and around the house. The neighbors have begun to uh, arrive and so forth. And uh, it's quite chaotic. And as Jesus shows up, then he says... Uh, uh, you know, I, I need you guys just to leave because she's only asleep. And of course, they, they laugh at Jesus. Other uh, translations uh, say they scoff at, uh, at Jesus. It's not the best atmosphere for having faith and trusting the Lord to do something in his life and in his home. But, uh, but he's determined uh, to trust the Lord in, in the midst of this. And uh, we find that... Uh, then Jesus basically clears everybody out. And in fact, we know in the, another gospel, he basically empties the house and he takes with him uh, mom and dad. And then he takes Peter, James, and John as well, which is, uh, again, because he's trying to, he's, he's going to minister and he wants to do it privately. He doesn't want more of a crowd, more of a stir. He's trying to avoid a direct confrontation with Jerusalem at this point, but he's trying to still bring Peter, James, and John. They, he wants them to see this. He wants to see his power. And, and they've been with him uh, in the storm on the scene. They've with him as he cast the demons out of the, uh, the guys there in Gadara and so forth. They're, they're watching and they're listening. They've heard the Sermon on the Mount. And he wants these three in particular to witness what he's about ready to do. The fourth thing about the father is he saw the ability of Jesus uh, to raise the dead. And as I mentioned, this is the first time in chronological order. Again, Matthew arranges his material, not chronologically, but topically uh, and for a purpose. But uh, here Jesus does something that he would do several times after this. But here he calls this little girl back from the dead. Uh, and it's a, a, a touching scene if you read some of the other accounts. He refers to her as, uh, as the little lamb and uh, little girl and my little child and so forth. And, and just the tender care of Jesus in this little girl, 12, who obviously has been going through a, a horrific time in terms of her illness and, and is, is probably uh, suffering or at least very much uh, desperate in, in uh, the loss of her own life and in sense, senses that being ebbed away and all of a sudden she's, <laughs> she, she's back at again and Jesus very tenderly uh, ministering to her during this time. Uh, John 5, 28 says, uh, do not be amazed at this for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to life. The good is receiving Jesus as Messiah. Those who have done evil, the rejection of him will rise to be condemned. So again, if you've been with somebody that, uh, uh, that has gone to be with the Lord, that has died, that has passed on, you, you recognize right away when that's happened. I mean, basically they're, they're there, but they're not there. Their body is there, but you recognize immediately they're, they're not there. Uh, any longer. So this little girl's body was there. She really wasn't there. And Jesus calls and brings her spirit back into the body and then just touches her and, uh, and raises her up. It's so one an amazing thing it, uh, it was for Peter, James, and John to, to witness this. But again, the, the courageous faith of this chief synagogue ruler who was willing to do anything to get to Jesus and absolutely believed based on what he had seen previously, that, that, that he could raise, him, raise his little girl from the dead. Let's look at the second person that's in the midst of the narrative, the woman who comes, and certainly we would say that her condition uh, is desperate as well in several ways. 
First, physically, her condition was desperate. As we see from the text, she's had um, uh, been bleeding for, for 12 years, and this would have had uh, all kind of uh, ramifications. Uh, secondly, religiously, her condition was desperate. Uh, a woman like this would be considered unclean according to the Mosaic Law in Leviticus 15. In fact, uh, many traditions at that time would have believed that she was going through this because of some immorality. We, find, we don't find that in the, in the text at all. It was just a, a common thought of the day. Um, also, because of that, uh, it was believed that her husband now has grounds for divorce as a result. We don't know if her husband hung in there or not. But uh, because of the fact that she's unclean, that means she can't go to synagogue, she can't go to the temple. That means nobody can physically touch her. If they touch her, they are unclean uh, at that point. It has to go through a process to be cleansed and, and so forth and would be limited in their contact with, with others. And this goes on and on. If you read Leviticus 15, it would have been, again, you know, kind of get into her shoes what this would have done to this woman for 12 years emotionally and so forth. Uh, whether her husband was there or not, if he stayed, God bless him, they would have no contact, no kind of relationship uh, at all. Financially, her condition was desperate. In Mark's gospel, in Mark 5, 26, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Now Luke who's a physician, a little kinder on the physicians on that, uh, that end, but we get the whole point. It had drained them financially. They didn't have a dime left. We say that her condition was desperate. It was, it was really desperate. And yet this woman had the courage to go through this crowd. Now, what if somebody recognized her in the crowd? And we know, again, from uh, other gospels that, that when, when uh, they're, the crowd is pressing against Jesus and she's in the midst of it, uh, every person that leaned against her, touched her, would be unclean. You think people would be real thrilled about that? We don't really get the concept, uh, you know, uh, for us. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, you can appreciate the fact that there could have been a little riot. In fact, they might have killed her for what she was doing. And she would have certainly realized that that was at least a possibility. That uh, she probably had not been out among people or in a crowd for years and years and years. So when we say that her faith was desperate to get to Jesus, it was really desperate. Uh, we could almost say that uh, if they kill me, they kill me, but I'm going. I'm going to get there. Also, we would say that her spiritual condition was desperate. Uh, the woman's faith was desperate. Ne not necessarily in Jesus, and Jesus would deal that. Uh, it's almost like a superstitious faith. She believes that if she can uh, get to him and, and grab the edge of his garment, that she'll be healed. Now, what she's going to grab is one of the tassels coming off of uh, off his, his garment. Again, uh, according to Numbers 15, 37, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at so you'll remember all the commands of the Lord to be able to remember and obey. And uh, again, sometimes in our Western mindset, though we try to often remind ourselves of the Jewishness of Jesus, that uh, he would have worn this garment. And in fact, that's what she grabbed. And uh, in one of the gospels, it says, and she clutched and she hung on. She believes that if she could touch, in a, in a sense, the essence of his Jewishness as a, as a, a rabbi, that then she would be healed. Well, it's kind of superstitious. It's like, you know, send you your 1995 and I'll send you one of uh, the handkerchiefs that Paul initially anointed in Corinth and, you know, so forth. You know, uh, it's, um, you know, our, our faith is only as good as in the object in whom it is placed. I don't want to suggest that that tassel wasn't worthy of this woman's courageous faith, but Jesus was. And, and Jesus deals with the issue, but he accepts the woman for her heart intent and what she was trying to do. I firmly believe that at some of these uh, healing evangelists that I believe are scandalous and, uh, and so forth, there's probably people genuinely healed from time to time. But that's despite them, not because of them. Because uh, God is compassionate and gracious and I think he recognizes just the intent of the heart and kind of uh, judges us based on that 
And that's what we see uh, here as, as well. Uh, think of the other aspect of this that, again, we miss culturally is that it would be a radical thing what she's doing because women did not touch men in public, even your own husband, much less a rabbi. So this, this woman is kind of, it's all out there. I mean, she's just risking everything uh, in order to try uh, uh, this last effort at being healed. Now, Jesus, uh, uh, he's, he stops. Again, this is in the middle of uh, Jarius, the chief synagogue ruler. Like, hey, can we get going like, or like right now? Hang on, hang on. You know, because he could, she was healed. He could have just, Jesus could have just walked on. But she, she, if he does that, then she thinks touching something healed her. And Jesus is going to straighten that out, you know, right now. So he turns and says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Shalom, or go in peace. He doesn't say, you touched my tassel, that's good. Would you like another one for 1995? Take it back to your friends. You see, he, he tries to deal with the hard intent and honors that, but at the same time, he's going to correct her, her thinking. Our faith is only as good as the object whom it is placed. Her faith healed her again God honors it because of uh, who Jesus is and his graciousness. But he says, it's your faith not in something, but in a person that's actually brought uh, healing to you. The other thing that Jesus is attempting to do, I think, believe here, is confirm her healing publicly. In the crowd, he says, she's been healed. You know, can you imagine the people that turn and go, <gasps> they recognize who that is suddenly? <laughs> get real concerned about the fact they've been mixing in a crowd with her and Jesus says, she's healed. Shalom. Go in, in peace. He gives her a new life, doesn't he? I mean, uh, even if she was healed, without those words of Jesus, without that delay in going and dealing with uh, Jairus, uh, she still somehow has to convince and prove and put her life back together and go to the priest and go through uh, the ceremonies and, uh, and so forth and hope to be accepted once again uh, into this community of believers. But Jesus kind of just deals with it all uh, right then with, with these words. As, as he does us as well. And, uh, and again, allows her opportunity for public confession in terms of her faith in him. Let's go on to uh, uh, the, the next uh, couple of fellows that we meet that are interesting as well. Uh, their faith very courageous also. Verse 27 to 31, two blind men are determined to follow Jesus. And kind of watch this closely because, uh, and watch Jesus' reaction to them. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, will it be done to you? And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly. See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him over that region. Uh, they called to him in mercy. And, uh, uh, and that's, uh, again, as we should as well. We, we come to God and we ask him to do things in our behalf. We appeal to his mercy. We don't demand anything. He's a holy and a righteous God. Uh, and when we pray for somebody to be healed, we pray for somebody to be blessed. We prayed for a certain situation. We're always praying, God, in your mercy, we come. <laughs> Never asking for what we deserve always asking for mercy. And that's what we're instructed to do in, in Hebrews uh, 4.15. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's a throne of grace. We can come with confidence, again, because Jesus Christ is our great high priest who uh, sits at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for us. Uh, because of that, we can come with confidence and receive mercy and find grace in our help of need. That's what uh, these two blind men are, are doing here. And notice they come uh, and call to Jesus in mercy, but also as their Messiah, they refer to him 
as I mentioned, as the, as the son of, uh, of David. So uh, again, firmly believing that, uh, that he, uh, he uh, is their Messiah and, and uh, uh, that's what everybody waited for. That's what uh, many are waiting for today in, in Israel, unfortunately. Waiting for that person to come in the Davidic line. Uh, the promises made to David to come through uh, his throne, be it established, ruling and so forth. What we refer to as his millennial or uh, uh, reign, the reign of the Messiah. Uh, we believe it will come in the future when, uh, when Yeshua or Jesus comes back again. But uh, here they take that title clearly receive him, call to him as their savior, as the Messiah. Now, this is interesting as well as you think about it. The third thing is they call to Jesus in faith without, without having seen any miracles. They're blind, right? So this is kind of different, isn't it? I mean, all the other, other everybody else in Capernaum, you had to have seen at least one. You probably saw 50 miracles, healings that Jesus did. These guys, it was just what they heard. It's what people told them. They have not really seen. Uh, so this, these guys are pretty determined. Uh, determined as well. Now notice that uh, they're, they're, they're following Jesus, calling out to him. And uh, he doesn't stop. <laughs> he just keeps walking. And uh, I just find that interesting. And there's, they're two blind guys. It's not like saying they were being led by friends. They're just two blind guys. And they're calling out, you know, son of David, have mercy on us. The implication, they're saying it over and over again. But they're also trying to keep a good ear out to make sure that they, they can keep up with them. And then, and then he goes in, in a house. And then they follow him in. And he's not going, hey, guys, over here. Hang a left. Make sure, you know, he just, he allows them to pursue. He allows them to see how determined are you to follow me? How determined are you? How courageous are you to believe that I really am the Messiah? That I really can heal you? Although they've not seen anything. Uh, and, and, and Jesus, again, brings them along, I think, in a sense, uh, test their faith so that they, they could know how strong their own faith is, even he, he does us. The... Um, and so he forces them, in a sense, to express their faith, and then he touches their eyes and says, again, according to your faith, let it be done, and their, their sight is restored. Uh, again, Jesus then warns them sternly, it says, now, I've done this privately for a reason. Don't go and tell others. Of course, human nature, you'd be like a little excited if you were blind and now you could see. Hi, how are you doing? Fine, I'm healed now. I just thought I'd mention that. I don't want to make a big deal out of it, though. I don't think so. Now, in a sense, it's not like Jesus would be surprised at what they were doing, but you still under, uh, he's not trying like reverse psychology to try to get these guys amped and, uh, uh, you know, he told us not to do it. Let's do it anyway. That's not it. He's trying to hold this thing down. This, the dynamic of what's going on. We know at a point in time, the crowd is so large, they try to make him king by force by the time he provides a few meals for them. But again, they are more interested in what's on the Messiah's table than the Messiah himself and have no comprehension at this point anyway, including his own disciples of what he is about to do in terms of fulfilling Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and being the suffering servant who would die for the sins of of the world. They don't understand it yet. He's trying to hold off this, this inevitable confrontation. And uh, we know at a point in time, though, when it's time, he will, the scriptures say he will set his face like flint towards Jerusalem, and he's going to the cross. And he will die on time on Passover, and he will march into, into Jerusalem exactly when the prophet Daniel said that he would to the very day. Not a day before, not a day after. And he tells them, uh, do not uh, tell anyone this. And he does it sternly. But certainly, these guys are, are healed, they're blessed, they recognize Jesus is the Messiah. Fourth thing, a very unique demon-possessed man is brought to Jesus in uh, verse 32 to 35. And this requires some explanation. Verse 32, while they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, 
preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And first, we note the demon-possessed man was unique. He was unique, not because he was possessed, but because he was possessed and he could not speak. It requires a little explanation. It's very important. The rabbinical teaching of that day uh, went along these lines. And there were, there were Jewish exorcists. We, we run into some in, in the book of Acts that were successful in what they did and so forth. And the way that they did it uh, is uh, to exorcise the demon was the way that Jesus did it when we saw him dealing with the, uh, the demon-possessed men uh, uh, in Gadara. And he, he spoke with them. And he found out their name. In that case was Legion, which means 6,000. And again, we don't know if there were two or more uh, men that were cast out or demons. But we know that there were, there were many. Because then he cast them into the, the pigs, uh, the 2,000 pigs. And they run off into the water. So that's how Jesus did it then. That was the traditional way of doing it. We have a problem here because this person that's possessed cannot speak. Physically, doesn't possess the ability. How would you then exercise the demon if you cannot engage, find out its name, and then cast him out? So the only person that can do that is the Messiah. So we have a, a particular, a very unique situation here. This is all a precursor to what happens in chapter 12. By the time we get to chapter 12, the time is right, the stage is set, now this official delegation that is growing and no longer is just the Pharisees but the Sadducees as well and as official representatives from the Sanhedrin are they going to purposely bring, they find a demon-possessed person who cannot see and cannot speak and they're going to bring him to Jesus and say, cast this one out. And of course, you know the story, uh, Jesus does. And in doing so then, the people say, could this be the son of David? Is this a Messiah? Because there's only two options for them at that point. One option, they recognize he is the Messiah. They get down on their knees in front of him like Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and they worship him and recognize him as the Messiah. Or two, if they don't do that, they have to give some explanation for how he just did what he did because nobody could do that. And the only person that can do that is the Messiah. So their explanation, they chose not to, not to bow down to him and accept him as their Messiah, unfortunately. And, they, and again, they are the official representatives of the nation at that point as the leaders. And they reject the Messiah and say, he's doing this by the power of Beelzebub or the power of the devil. What we have here is a precursor to that event. This news is going to spread. And that's why the people say nothing like this has ever ever been seen, not in this area, but in all of Israel. And, uh, and now the, the word is really going out. Jesus is just done. He's raised somebody from the dead. He's cast a demon out of someone that can't speak. Could this be the Messiah? He must be the Messiah. So th that's the talk. It's no longer he's a great itinerant rabbinical teacher who can do some miracles this, the, the ante is being raised here, and the drama is growing as, uh, as Matthew presents uh, his gospel. And of course, the Pharisees were indignant uh, and said that he did this by the power uh, of the demons. Now, notice that the Pharisees acknowledged the miracle. They didn't say he didn't do it. They said he did it and healed the guy he could speak. So they're not doubting the, the miracle. They're just trying to come up with some explanation that keeps them from admitting that he is who he says he is in terms of uh, his messiahship. Again, our, uh, our point to all of this and to try to draw it to a conclusion before we have uh, communion is that God does allow us to get kind of desperate at times. Uh, and in our desperation, he makes it worse sometimes. And the delays come. And uh, we want to see God move. And he's saying, don't be afraid, trust me. And you're saying, yeah, but I've never seen you do this, what I need you to do. I've never seen you get this done in my life, the thing I'm concerned about, or my kids, or my neighbors, or my friends. Uh, the other thing that I've prayed and you answered, and I've seen you do that before, I can have faith in that. It's the things that I haven't seen you do before that I need you to do now. And you're saying, wait, trust. But again, like the... Uh, 
Jarius if we come in humility and we bow down and worship and we come to him and, and believe what the scriptures say, some of the ones that we went through, that we can trust the Lord. And uh, because we're either going to have faith or we're going to have fear, we'll see God be, be faithful to us and do things that we haven't seen him do before in our life and the lives of others. Again, like the woman that comes just demonstrating tremendous courage, sometimes the Lord allows us to just get to the end where <laughs> I'm going to come to him and trust him because it's just all I got left. It's my last shot. And uh, the Lord, even if we're kind of off a little bit in our faith and our theology, the Lord uh, certainly understands and takes us uh, where we're at. He appreciates uh, the heart intent. I wanted to uh, read a little poem I came across uh, uh, the other day. It must be from our study in the Psalms, getting the poetry. Bear with me. Uh, this is called Guest. It's by a, a woman named Martha Shell Nicholson. She writes, Pain knocked upon my door and said that she had come to stay. And though I would not welcome her, but bade her go away, she entered in like my own shade. She followed after me, and from her stabbing, stinging sword, no moment was I free. And then one day another knocked most gently at my door. I cried, no pain is living here, and there is no room for more. Tis I, be not afraid. And from the day he entered in, the difference it has made. For though he did not bid her leave, my strange unwelcome guest, he taught me how to live with her. Oh, I had never guessed that we could dwell so sweetly here, my Lord and pain and I, within this fragile house of clay, while years slip slowly by. Because I want to uh, also remind you that he doesn't always heal, and he doesn't always make it go away. And sometimes he just enters into it with us and says, trust me, even if I don't do the miracle. Because the miracle is you can get through this and I'll go through it with you. Uh, again, an interesting line, uh, that we would dwell so sweetly here, my Lord, in pain and I, within this fragile house of clay, while years go slipping by. And sometimes they do. And we wish the Lord would move, but like the Apostle Paul, who prayed three times of his own physical uh, ailment, though he had healed many others, he prayed that the Lord would heal him, and the Lord simply said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And Paul came to understand that, uh, that in his weakness, uh, yeah, again, God's grace could be manifested in his life like, like no other. And... Uh, Again, so as we go through, we look at people with courageous faith that do courageous things. And uh, we, we pray that we could do that without the, the radical circumstances and that we would just learn to trust the Lord in other ways. But I think we'd all admit that, that there's just times when we're a little more spiritual and we're a little more concerned and we're a little more crying out to the Lord and we're a little more needy to hear from him in certain times of our lives than others. And after you've been through a few, you kind of, Okay, Lord, I, I understand this. <laughs> I wish that I would be this fervent all the time, but I, I understand that you're allowing it. You'll even turn up the heat at times. It's for your purposes. And when we're doing that, what are we doing? We're just surrendering to the Lord. What was the issue as we looked at last week with the, the guys that would not go with Jesus and be his disciples? They wouldn't get in the boat, even though there was, they didn't know there was a storm coming. There were too many other issues of their lives that were important to them that kept them from following Jesus Christ. Now, and I want to suggest that if, if you'll give up the idea that walking with Jesus means a happy, comfortable life, you're going to be a lot better off. Because when it doesn't come, instead of bailing, you'll just be able to accept it, that it's part of your experience of walking with the Lord, but he will never leave us, never forsake us. And we just go through it. And then we, we come out the other side and we see him do incredible things. And, and we're all like, right on, Lord. <laughs> I'm glad that I, that I hung in there and trusted you instead of fearing all the way through it. So... Some of you are going through those times. Others, uh, it's ahead. Uh, and I pray that, again, not my words, but again, 
the Bible as you go through it, as you underline these people, their circumstances, what Jesus said. You don't have to remember what I said. You just go back to your Bible. You go back to this story. You go back to this woman and think it through again and see God's faithfulness to her. And then God's word will minister to your heart. Don't remember what I said. Remember what the Bible says. Amen. This far view, I can't really see you, but all I do, somehow it's all about you, just breathe in this air, all this living that we do must be going somewhere. Must be toward you, this passionate purpose, the fire that burns in us or burns us, the quiet or riot inside, the fullness that fills us or kills us, the fight that we The fullness 
voice that fills us or kills us, the fight that we fight, we fight, the fight that we fight, we fight, the fairness of songs, like a whisper or a theme, the voice that calls Like water Musically falling Your presence around Like the hush of snow Falling to my knees I fall Crawl to holy ground So wild and ruthless So savage the kind that finds us as light in the darkness ignites the power to fill and to free us baptized by Because of your 
your life. I don't have to hide in the shadow of shame. You have washed me in your blood. So new, let's put our hands together. And all my brokenness and sadness are washed away in your sweet rain. Because of your hope, I'm not afraid. I gotta live in hope beyond the grave. And all your promises are mine to hold. And every moment of my life is just another moment I can live in you. Because of you. Because of you. Bless the Lord together.